So what I'm going to tell you today is a bit the sort of introduction to what anthropology and photography have in common. Um, and can I just briefly ask if any one of you has um, sort of a relation to anthropology? Like, do we have any anthropology students among you? No? Okay, well, yes, this I know. And you also have some idea. And most of you are from, um, from this faculty, right? So faculty of fine arts. Okay, so, um, so that's actually quite okay because I'm going to give you an introduction to not so much anthropology, but to what anthropology had to do with photographs in particular. Because the thing is that um, photographs is also, as I know, um, a discipline you can study at you know, fine arts since 1950s and photographs have become recognized as an art form, but that hasn't always been the case. So if you go a bit further back in history to the sort of ages when um, photography started, you'll find that there's a coincidence between the starting date of anthropology and photography. So they started almost at the same time. They had a lot in common in the beginning, and this is kind of like what I want to draw out for you. So the historical background of that. And then also the kind of problems that anthropology had in the last 150 years, um, and how they try to progress from these problems and still make use of photography despite the you know, problematic past. So what I'm going to um, talk about is first, you know, the first point is the historical stuff, um, and then we sort of jump. Um, we jump to what is called the visual return, which is something that anthropology did in, roughly started to do in the 1980s. Um, to then do another jump towards digitization, which as you might um, imagine, um, developed in the last, say, two decades. Um, and then to proceed to the digital return as a particular method that anthropology does in relation to photography and digitization. So the first part um, definitely is going to be the longest one because um, you know, to uh, um, give you a background is quite necessary in order to understand the other points. Um, so if we look at anthropology and photography in the early ages, we'll find, no, I mean, let me start differently. Who knows when photography was um, developed? Like when was photography invented? Does anybody have a clue roughly about the time? The first photograph was a, hmm? First part of, uh, oh, like the whole of the uh, 19th century? Yes, 19th century is correct. Um, the first photograph was, um, I wanted to display, but I, don't, I forgot about that. So the first photograph was um, developed in 1826 um, by a French man called Nietzsche. Um, nine, 1826. Um, and it always developed further and further. I forgot to, to bring you that. Um, it was really something where you couldn't see anything. I mean, you just could see, so like the outline of a building in that first photograph in 1826. And it took eight minutes to develop that photograph. Um, and the next years brought a lot of progress. Um, the exposure time decreased. You could do it within like a minute. Um, and within only 13 years, which is for that time a really short period of time, photography was taken to other parts of the world. So in 1840, only 30 years later, you had the first photo studios in India, for example. Um, and I give you that background in order to get an idea how, how eager people were to have photography as a means of documentation for anthropology. So anthropology was also a new discipline, right? It was only recently established, and it came with that idea of humanitarianism. So people wanted to document people in other parts of the world. They wanted to know how do people live, what do they look like, what do they use, what kind of you know clothes do they wear, what are their facial expressions and that stuff. And in order to document that, what better method than photography? So that's why 
Only shortly after photography was developed, there were the first photo studios set up all over the world. So 1840s in um, India, 1850s in Southern America, um, and by 1860s pretty much all over the world. And the first photographs um, came out pretty much um, like this, for example. This is um, from, don't want to say anything wrong, from 1868. Um, eight volumes entitled The People of India. Um, and they were pretty much trying to document how people lived in India, according to races, according to tribes, according to you know communities, pretty much that were branded either castes or tribes or races. Um, all very problematic terms in anthropology, um, not being used, but in the 1850s, 1860s, very common. And in order to understand the people better, you would like to document them through photography, for example. Um, so this was, as I said, eight volumes, and they had about 450 um, photographs in them, documenting various people of India. Um, another example is this one, um, sort of not just documenting people and their um, facial appearance, but also kind of, you know, the environment around it. Um, this is uh, from 1907, um, a little bit later, Edward Curtis um, trying to, you know, grasp and document how people look like in various parts of the world, just to, you know, give you a few examples, not only from India. Um, and there was pretty much in these early times, so in the, even though this is early 20th century, in the 19th century, what soon developed in regards to photography was a distinction between anthropometric photographs and ethnographic photographs. So ethnographic photographs is sort of um, what we had here, kind of people in their environments, um, looking at the clothes, looking at, you know, the habits, um, and anthropometric photographs was a big issue, that's sort of that stuff. And there are way, way worse photographs, which I'm not going to reproduce. Um, but anthropometric photographs developed from that idea of documenting measurements, document, uh, do documenting data, documenting the facial proportions, the nose index, and all that kind of, I'm just going to say weird bullshit that led to um, physical and racial anthropology a bit later. So people had that idea, if we document people through photography, we can, from these photographs, read the proportions and then get some kind of idea about what types of people do we have everywhere around the world, um, note down all the numbers, and then connect it to our various theories. So you have images like this with a white back cross, or sometimes you have these checked um, backgrounds. Um, you usually also have some kind of measuring scale that would allow you to um, get measurements. Um, and the, uh, the other um, photographs which you had a lot um, was the ethnographic, which sort of documents um, more people in their natural environment um, in order to get an idea on how people um, lived and um, behaved and cooperated with each other. Um, there were in the early days even some, some books describing for you know, whoever wanted to go into the field how you would take photographs because the method of course would be different when you wanted to do anthropometric photographs than when you wanted to do um, ethnographic photographs. Um, yes. Um, and just briefly relating to the anthropometric photographs, um, you can also imagine that in order to take these images, 
you need environments where people would stand still, where they would not always voluntarily want to be photographed. Um, so these images were actually quite often also shot in prisons. They were shot in um, sort of colonial environments where it was quite clear that the person who's coming is, is privileged, has a higher status than the other one, has the power to say, we're not gonna, we are not, we are now gonna do the series of photographs. You have to stand still and obey to what we do. Um, highly problematic. Um, whereas these photographs were sometimes taken in the same context. Of course, the overall larger political context is mostly the same, colonial times, right? So you have usually people from Europe or Euro-America, um, what we today also call the Global North, taking pictures of people who are from areas which are usually colonized or coming from the Global South, so um, quite a hierarchical dimension. Um, two special forms among these photographs are missionary photography and studio photography. Um, I'm going to show you this one as an example of missionary photography because one background of taking these first anthropological images is um, missionaries. So you have these Christian missionaries coming to various parts of the world and they take photos not out of um, a humanist ideal or because they want um, data in terms of measurements, but because they want to document how much progress they're making in converting people. And then they send home these photographs together with some descriptions and saying, you know, um, please everybody who's funding us, um, continue to do so because we're making a lot of progress converting people to Christianity. So there are actually quite large missionary archives these days um, because of that context. And another form of um, photography that developed in the early days is the so-called studio photography, which you can see in this image you have this backdrop usually, like a painting or whatever kind of backdrop you know you desired or the studio had available, and then a scene which would be staged. So people would be uh, situated in various um, forms, either in the way that um, would fulfill a cliche, kind of like what would the audience back home expect, um, in this case Japan to look like, or sometimes also what people wanted to display. So people also voluntarily went to photo studios and you know, dressed up in particular ways, um, display themselves with various symbols in order to get their image taken, which then presents what they think um, they would like to be represented as. So this is actually also an example. Um, you can see on the on the left side that there is some kind of backdrop, and you can see that the people are situated in a way. You know, the the father, of course, you know, standing, putting the hand on the uh, on the shoulder of his wife. They're all carrying books or Bibles in order to represent, you know, we are now converted to Christianity and we are able to read. So this photo being a particular example of both missionary and studio photography. Um, in terms of the cliché, um, we do have a lot of photography in these early days kind of trying to um, cater to this image of, you know, the exotic other. So when people went, for example, to what we don't call the Orient anymore, but, you know, these Oriental countries, um, you'd always have the people back home expecting, oh, you know, there's like the harem, and, you know, people, like women, easily, um, you know, just being covered barely, and this is an, still an easygoing image. I, I try to not reproduce, like, the really um, derogative ones. Um, but you can get an idea, right? That these images, which you then might even sell back home, um, and so not just produced for science, but also for a general lay audience, sort of cater to the taste of your audience. So if people back home have the idea of, you know, the Orient being that exotic place, you would, of course, construct or create images which would 
cater to their cliché. Um, and another point regarding photography in the uh, um, 19th century, then again connected to science, is that when people tried to document from a more like scientific perspective, it was always connected to power, not just in the situation of shooting a photo, but also in, in relation to how you publish it. So this again is the people of India, which I showed you in the beginning, eight volumes documenting various communities in India, um, published between 1868 and 75, almost 500 images, and these images came, which is a bit hard to read, um, but they usually came with a subtitle saying this and this tribe or this and this caste, and then a small description about what this caste would be like or this community would be like. So the idea behind that was that in India at that time it was of course British rule and just briefly before this, um, this book or these volumes were published there was the first uprising in India, the so-called Sepoy Uprising. So in 1857, a lot of Indians sort of revolted against the British rule, wanted to be independent. And what did the British do? They said, oh my God, so they, in the first instance, with military force, um, destroyed that uprising. But in the aftermath, they said, okay, if we want to control this country, if we want to rule this country and exploit it as much as we can, we have to have an idea about what these people are like. So every military man, um, every servant of the British had to get an idea of what are the people of India like. And the best way, as it was perceived, would be to document all the people of India, give a description about what they're like, their characteristics, what kind of habits they are, that they have. Um, and so the, uh, Lord Cunningham decided, let's just have this compendium um, documenting the people in photographs and description in order to rule the country easier. Um, so I to some extent have to um, have to say the first statement that I made that photography developed out of that humanistic approach, you know, we want to get to know the people, we want to know more about the world is only one side of the coin because the other side of the coin is uh, you want to know them, but you want to rule them as well, right? So it's power relations which are embedded. And as you might know, knowledge is power, which this particular book or volumes of books are a good example of. Um, and of course, you don't just collect knowledge of other people, but you also produce knowledge. So when you fix these images into a book, along with the inscriptions, you also fix these characteristics. So everybody would read, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people would refer to these books and say, oh, this is what these people are like. And this is not just an idea of, you know, which is created in people's mind, but it had political impl implications. For example, there were particular people in India described as criminal tribes. And if you're branded through that book as a criminal tribe, it would also mean that you would be deployed of some, um, some basic human rights. For example, you would have, being a part of that criminal tribe, you would have to report in, on a regular basis to various police stations and not be allowed to move freely around. So, producing knowledge through photography and descriptions in these volumes had direct effects on how you could um, move around and how your rights would be either, you know, granted or taken away from you. Um, I wonder why I have this one in. Um, oh yes, and the idea um, that, and the question why we use photography and not just written form also goes back to that idea. If you write something down, it's usually based on the knowledge of a person 
But if you document that same thing with a photograph, you also have sort of like a proof. Because photography was, especially in its early days, always regarded as something objective, right? I mean, you even in English, I actually don't know in Czech, um, but in English you have that term objective, which means lens as well. Um, so <coughs> photography was regarded as something documenting the truth. And if you think about it, there is definitely some essence to it because a photograph can only document what is there at a particular time and place, right? So it is essentially documenting something real, but as I try to show you, it definitely also documents what you arrange as the person setting up the stage, for example. It is, of course, um, taking away that kind of notion of the artist. You know, these were sort of forms um, displaying the exotic other before photography. Painters drawing pictures of what they see, but it will always include their interpretation, right? Their brush strokes, their interpretations of various scenes. So people were thinking this, taken as a you know, technical documentation, um, objective with the lens is way closer to truth or reality than the painting. Um, so much for the early days of photography. Um, if I recapitulate, um, you know that photography is constructed, you know that photography was used in the early days by anthropology with various issues, um, including a lot of political power, including the will to, to document, um, to categorize people, um, and it led, especially in Germany, subsequently um, to the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and where photography was also used by anthropologists in order to categorize people according to where they're coming from, attributing it to characteristics, and then leading to um, mass executions of people according to where they're coming from. So anthropology definitely played a large part in, in the um, Holocaust and the homicide, um, and photography was in part used for that. Um, and the question is, if you take these two, I'd say, dark chapters um, into equation, so the colonial times and then the um, Nazi times, could you still do something with anthropology? And could you still do something with photographs and anthropology if you think about these sort of um, historical um, periods? Um, and of course, the answer is, is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, but, but if you take that into account, you, you might also know or you know, imagine that it was not easy, right? If you know that anthropology used to work like this, and then like this, and then all of a sudden, yeah, so what do we do now? Like after the Second World War, anthropology had to slowly reinvent itself. Um, and it did, yes. Um, anthropology is not, well, I'd say not completely based um, on colonialism these days. Um, there is, of course, a discourse about neo-colonial um, uh, colonialism being all around, which is not something I want to go into now. Um, I would rather want to tell you how anthropology developed in the 1960s, 70s, 80s in order to get to what we call a visual um, return as a practice of dealing with photographies from an anthropological perspective. So what happened? One important issue was um, this particular book. Um, it is published by James Clifford and George Marcus in the 1980s, end of the 1980s. It's called Writing Culture, and it was sort of a starting point for a huge debate called the Writing Culture Debate. So what these, along with other colleagues, did was posing the big question of well, how do we actually produce knowledge in anthropology? 
So how do we do that? How can we actually represent someone else if we are still, you know, scientists, individuals, men, women, whatever. I mean, you are always someone writing about someone else, right? So there's always some kind of representation involved for the good or the worse, but there is a representation involved. So if we are writing, we might as well always consider that we are a person writing, producing something, right? So it's never going to be unfiltered. It's never going to be objective. It's, it's always going to be a subjective characteristic included in producing knowledge in anthropology, as well as in other disciplines, but that's a different topic. Um, fact is that anthropology, all anthropologists had to go through that, or should go through that kind of reflecting um, what anthropology did so far in terms of structuring people, in terms of trying to come up with larger theories. Um, and this writing culture debate sort of opened up um, kind of post-structuralist view on things, a kind of deconstructing your own discipline in order to be able to say anything at all. Um, so this was a very important issue and I think it's, um, I hope that the experience from your um, studies, the, the few anthropologists among you, um, sort of stress that or um, say that that's correct, that um, you know, anthropology has to face the issue of we are constructing knowledge and we have to take that into consideration. So we have to be reflexive about what we're doing. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. That's one point for the visual return. Another point for the visual return um, is what has been called the iconic turn or the visual turn. Um, and this is um, the 1990s, when a lot of disciplines said, well, actually, images are not so bad after all. Um, images can be a research topic. Images can be the object of our studies. So there were quite a few disciplines turning to images, to visuals. Um, and picture theory um, is just one example of the books that um, contributed to that visual or iconic term. Um, by W.J.T. Mitchell, who is not an anthropologist, but whose book cover I just put up here in order to represent that kind of notion of a visual iconic terms in various disciplines. And anthropology also um, sort of developed that idea of, yes, actually we can think about images as a topic. So we, if we think in anthropology about people, we can also think about people in relation to images, to visuals. So there were a lot of disciplines um, developing around that time that has visuals in their, in their names. Um, be it visual anthropology, be it um, visualizations of... <laughs> um, I, yeah, computational visualistics, media informatics, visual histories. So all of them use images not merely as illustrations, but as the core objective of analysis. Um, and the questions were, of course, then sometimes the relationship between um, society and the images, the meaning for history production, um, the role of, um, of visuals towards written text, and so on and so forth. So various disciplines develop questions with visuals as their core um, uh, focus. Um, so that's the second part, which will eventually lead us to visual return. Um, jumping a little bit back in time um, to the 1970s, we have um, this book, quite influential, um, by Collier and Collier, although I might pronounce that wrong. Um, but um, this was in the 1970s sort of a leading book on the method of using photographs 
in anthropological research. Um, the method that the two authors describe is what they call photo elicitation. So what you could do in anthropology was actually use photographs that either you took or someone else took um, and then elicit information from informants. So sort of draw out information by you know, showing the people the image and saying with an open question, so what do you think about this? Or what do you think this is? Or can you tell me more about this? So a method of working within anthropology was using photographs or images, you know, be it aerial photographs, be it landscapes, be it you know, even the anthropometric images I showed you in the beginning in order to get information from people. And it's a good starting point. I mean, the few anthropologists here might know that it's um, tricky if you have a research question, you go to the field, you see people, you talk to them about identities. So it's like really hard. I mean, people are not going to tell you anything about their identities. And it's just too abstract, right? So, you can't really start with saying, oh, hi, what do you think about, can you tell me something about your identity or, you know, values or whatever, all these big issues, migration, politics, right? You come to people, you talk about this, really hard, really, really tricky. So, in the 70s, people said, oh, this is actually a good idea. If you have photographs, something that people can actually relate to, you'll still find out something about migration, you'll find out something about politics, you'll find out something about their identities, but through the medium of the image, right? So you show people images and they're going to tell you something. Ah, oh, yeah, this is my neighbor and this is he's wearing this and this and you know, or this used to be like this, but these days we're doing it differently. And all of a sudden people start talking about their identity, about politics, but through the medium of photography. So photo elicitation was quite um, so prominent at that time, but if you think about this, and if you think about what I told you before about the writing culture debate, you might come to the conclusion that this um, has been criticized. Why? Because people said, well, actually, if you go to the field and you only elicit, you draw something out of people, you use photographs as a can opener, it, it just takes something from the people, but you don't give anything back. Right? So if you reflect yourself, as a scientist, as a researcher in that situation, you know, sort of a bit close to, you know, colonial ideas or to an agenda which only takes something from people but is not giving anything back. Um, so that method has been criticized um, in the 1990s as, as being just one-sided. Um, so what people came up with then was what is called the visual return. So if you use photographs and go to the field, you don't just take something out of people in the sense of information, but you should actually also use it that people in a, in a way that people get something back. So um, what you can do is use photographs as a means of, of empowerment. And there are some classical examples where um, people take old photographs to places. For example, Joshua Bell did that, taking it to Papua New Guinea. Um, and the people in these places then actually could use the photographs for political demands. So in his particular case, people said, um, oh, see this photograph we can use as a means of proof when we demand particular inheritance of places or when we demand certain rights from the government. So there was that idea of if you use photographs, you should use it in a reciprocal way, that it's not just something for you as a researcher, but also something which people can make sense of. Um, and this is a wonderful idea. Um, I tried to do that um, in, my, in my PhD research, um, which took place in India. So you can see there are also um, old photographs which I um, reproduced, um, photos from the 1920s, which were taken in Kerala and southern India. Um, and I went with that idea of, yeah, you know, let's just take these images back to Kerala and then people can use it as a means of empowerment. You know, they might just get something out of it. Um, so I had that question, 
in my mind, can people actually still do anything with these images after 80 years, right? And, well, I mean, to be honest, um, the results were a bit mixed. It's not like people said, oh, wow, finally, we do have these images and we have a means of, you know, being empowered all of a sudden. Um, but it was more like, you know, some people said, yeah, it's, it's, you know, interesting, I can make something out of it, I can see um, this and this um, was the place where, say, my grandpa used to do this and this, so I can see there's progress or development in that particular um, photo if you compare it to today's situation. But there were also people who told me quite, quite straightforward, well, honestly, I'm, I'm not interested in your photographs. I mean, this is just, it was nice for you, but I'm not interested. Um, and people actually all around won't be much interested. So, um, it was sort of, let's say, um, a mixed reaction from people. Um, but I want to tell you one particular story um, from that research where it did make, um, well, not sense, but it, but it led to people telling stories about um, what they are doing and what they are thinking people in various places are doing. So. The story I want to tell you relates to that particular image, um, which was taken in the 1920s and 1928 in Kerala, and it was called the, the Ready Dancer. So that photographer, who was a German, took that image, and at the same time, he also um, collected the objects that the person is wearing. So that full dress, which is part of a ritual in the Southern Kerala, was packed and shipped to, to Germany and became part of a museum. And this museum saw the photographs, um, saw the objects, and in the early 2000s decided, oh, let's, let's have that on this plate. So they put that up in the museum. Um, and if you go to um, that particular museum, you can actually see, see it this way. So they reconstructed the way it is arranged um, according to the photograph. So before they had the photo, which was lost and then found again, they didn't know which part goes where, but with the photo they said, oh great, now we can put it on display. Um, when I went to, to uh, Kerala and showed this image, to a person that is still practicing this ritual, he said, well, I mean, excuse me, but this is kind of, well, this is, this doesn't make any sense, right? And I showed him also this image, I showed him, oh, but this is how, it, how it's, you know, portrayed in, a, in the museum, is, you know, according to the program. And he said, yeah, but, I mean, you can actually sort of see that it's supposed to be Mutta Panteya, the God, um, but it doesn't make sense out of two reasons. Reason number one, this is a museum. Why would you put a living thing in a museum, right? So this person, he was actually performing this ritual um, and still is these days performing the ritual and saying, you know, it's a live thing. It's something which we do every day. So A, why put it in, in a museum? I don't really appreciate this. And the second thing is, um, that's him, Balakrishnan, um, preparing to become Muttapajaya. So you can see this image, and then this, and then it goes on and on and on until it um, comes out like this, or like this, and then it's usually um, a few hours of performance. But I think what you can see is that Muta Pantea has never performed without a complete makeup on the face and the upper body. So this was the second point which he which he like clearly criticized, right? If you want to put it in, in a museum, why do you do it in this incorrect way? Because we can't perform it without the makeup, so it doesn't really make any sense to have it in this particular form in the museum. There's just you know no upper upper body or facial makeup does make sense. Incorrect. Um, so yeah, this just as a short um, sort of diversion of... Excuse um, me, who, yeah. who does the ritual represent? 
Um, so this in particular is, um, well, he's taking the shape of a god. So it's not, it's not a, he's not dancing, like just, you know, kind of, you know, on stage dancing something, but he actually becomes Muttapan. Muttapan is a god and he'll be, you know, with the uh, music and so on and so forth, a lot of um, drumming involved, he'll, he'll, you know, the god will eventually come into his body, he'll be personificating the god, and once that ritual, which usually depends on the context, sometimes goes on for an hour, sometimes goes on for a full night, when it comes to an end, people can also come to the god and ask him questions, and he'll sort of, you know, answer questions for them. Um, and my my friend Balakrishnan he also says if he's if he's doing that he's not Balakrishnan he is the god he's Muttapan so it is really you know a religious a religious um, ritual it's important for people um, locally and they still perform it even though it's um, you know more than a hundred years old a few hundred years old. So these are the first photographs staged. Yes. Yes. So yeah, this one. Um, is something which the museum before putting it on display didn't reflect. It's this is not for this was not taken in the context of a performance. This was taken in the context of the photographer buying the costume. So he asked this man in the photograph in the 1920s, please put these things on so I can see how it's put on. And the person did, but it was not in the context of a performance. So. If you display it in a museum, you should also sort of, at least that's what I think, reflect on that. That, you know, this is not a representation of Muta Pantea. This is a representation of that photograph with its particular background and context. But it can't stand, at least this is what Balakrishnan said, it can't stand as a representation of Muta Pantea. Um, yes. So you can actually see that visual return does make sense in order to give, um, you know, people a voice, um, in order to criticize or deconstruct what people are doing with um, cultural heritage. Moving on from there, this particular image which I showed you is now part of an um, online database. So this is just a screenshot. Um, all these images from that collection have been, have been digitized and put online um, recently. I think they finished one or two years back. Um, as is the case with many other anthropological photographs. Not all of them, of course, they're like huge archives of photos still, you know, laying um, in, in basements or um, locked up. Um, but there have been quite some digitization projects in the last, let's say, um, 10 or 20 years. And the idea behind digitizing anthropological photographs are um, on the one hand side, on the one hand, um, preservation, of course, because you have to think about the fact these images, for example, the original photographs are now more than 90 years old. Yeah, no, roughly 90 years old. So if you have this material, mostly nitrate film, it can dissolve. Um, usually the lifespan of this material is about 100 years. And then it can really happen that the photograph just the film dissolves. So people digitize a lot of photographs in order to preserve the photograph, saying if we digitize it, we at least have the content. Um, and the second aspect is you want to provide access. So quite, well, not often, but sometimes people, um, especially from um, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Northern America, um, demand access to photographs or objects which are housed in other uh, museums or archives. And indigenous communities are not as demanding in um, India, but that is not um, an issue or a reason to not digitize. So quite a few objects and images are digitized, put up online in order to grant access to what is called um, a cultural heritage or a shared heritage. Um, and this 
as something which you might be able to, to read. So the idea here of this particular archive is um, underlined there. Um, the project has turned this hidden archive into an online resource accessible to people across the world. So the idea is, if you digitize something and put it on the internet, it's available to everyone um, who has internet access, and it's sort of a, well, it's, it's not a right to have this access, but we are sort of morally obliged to do that. Um, i just show you a few examples. Um, this is the Bali Mission Archives, one of the missionary archives, which was one of the first um, photo archives going online in 2002. Um, but they are not, I mean, digitization projects are not just there in, the, uh, in Euro America, but they also um, spring up in um, other parts of the world. This is a project based in, in India where people are saying, okay, let's just digitize um, the images we have um, or collect images in order to digitize them to make them accessible um, to people all over. And the forms differ, of course, some are more just, you know, images with a set of metadata, like, you know, the photographer and the year and the place. This particular example comes also with a long, um, narrative connected to it where people if you scroll down um, describe what you can see in the image and then you can um, comment on it, you can share it, like it and so on and so forth. So various forms of how you can um, put things online. Um, and digitization, I don't want to go too much into detail, but if you digitize it, it's usually a longer process. You have to think about um, the database, you have to think about the semantic web, so how do you connect it? You have to think about how can people retrieve this information, um, how you want to make it accessible, um, how many information you want to provide. So it's also, you know, these are usually projects which take a lot of manpower, which take a lot of money, which take a lot of knowledge and consideration. Um, so I don't want to well, I definitely want to appreciate what people are doing when they when they put it online. Um, but this idea of you know we'll make things accessible to everybody in the world also has its shortcomings or its, its um, or pitfalls because even though you might have that idea of you know the internet is a web and it's you know democratizing everything and it's making access easier and it's available to everyone in the world is of course not happening because we do have the digital gap we do have the fact that you know people in some areas of the world have less facilities to access the internet than others um, you also have the fact that um, the infrastructure is sometimes controlled or tried to be controlled by um, various companies so you know even if you have that idea, the internet as the ultimate means um, to equality, it's just not working this way. But it is um, an attempt, of course. Um, and if you want to take it a bit further, if you not just want to put it out there and say, oh, well, I, I put it out there, so, you know, let's just, you know, the rest is up to the world or to people. Um, if you want to go a bit further, um, you can do what is called, or has been called, um, a digital return. Um, which of course, as you might guess, is connected to this visual return, right? So kind of giving something back in a not one-sided way, um, but usually connects to that idea of digitizing something, instead of having it um, in a, you know, um, drawer or folder or, you know, locked away behind the doors. Digitizing it and then intentionally, through the networks that you have online and offline, um, communicating with people who also have a share or an interest in that material. And I want to give you, um, as the last thing, um, 
a kind of idea of one project that um, I did together with a few colleagues and friends of mine um, as one example of a digital return, which sort of developed out of a workshop that I organized together with um, Daniel Rycroft, a colleague of mine, where we invited various people from India and Europe. Um, so people who, on the one hand, are the custodians of these archives um, in Great Britain and Germany, but on the other hand, also people who are or whose ancestors might be depicted in these images. Um, and these images come from India, yes. Um, they they are now housed in three different archives. And when we had this workshop thinking about what we can do with these images, the people from India said, well, actually, you know, just, we want access to these images, so please put them online or, you know, digitize them in some form if they're not already online, so we can make use of it. Um, and this is, due to that demand, this is what, um, what was done. Um, either online or uh, digitized and then um, burned on a CD. Um, given back to um, people from um, the Lakhba community in northwestern India. Um, and this is just a few impressions of what um, people did. So the images were digitized and then either downloaded or um, taken from the um, CDs and reproduced. So people from the Lakhba community, which you can see here, um, decided themselves what they wanted to do, and what they wanted to do was this, what they called Pura Jumi Ankh, through the eyes of the ancestors. It was a mix of exhibition and ancestral worship. So they reproduced um, a few tens of these images, um, around 90, and one you can see in the background there, um, putting it at an um, ancestral site, which is still used for worship, and a few of them went into these baskets. And the baskets were, um, were um, not consecrated, but um, they were included into a puja, into a worship system. Um, they were celebrated, so people danced and sang songs. Um, people also just you know, just watch the images as a kind of exhibition. Um, and a few of the images were then later taken to uh, houses, close <coughs> by, where they were put on the walls um, in close proximity to various gods that are worshipped, um, as well as ancestors. Um, which you can see also here, the images being down there at the bottom and the backdrop is um, a representation of a um, worldview of these people. Um, so in this particular form, the, the, or in, this, in this particular case, um, people use digital images in order to appropriate them in their particular ways according to their visual economy and their visual worldviews. Um, what was really important for, for me was that it was not imposed on the people, so it's not like you said, well, here, take the images and do um, you know, a particular exhibition or use them as your ancestors, but it was a demand that came from um, the, the Ratva or their um, friends, and it was kind of, you know, okay, there's an offer, I mean, use them or don't use them, um, whatever, we just, you know, fulfill what you wanted, um, we digitize them, um, and they decided how they want to use it, um, which can also be um, for educational purposes um, in the end. Um, this example is, of course, um, not the only one, there are many more. Um, there are also examples where um, people don't want to depend on existing archives and start creating their own ones, is what I already told you briefly, and these are, um, this one I showed you already, this is another one where um, 
people are creating their own archives on the issue in this particular case on um, independence between India and Pakistan. Um, and to summarize, um, I think it has become clear that photography and anthropology have a close relation to each other, that this relation was hardly ever unproblematic, especially um, in the beginnings and let's say the first um, hundred years. It hasn't stopped to be problematic, it still is problematic. Um, there are still various critiques um, about taking photos, because of course anthropologists still take photos. Um, you can use current or contemporary photography, like you know this one or this one, and, um, as an anthropologist to document um, what you're doing. You can do it, uh, you can produce photographs um, in order to produce um, visual essays, for example, or photography essays. Um, you are always confronted if you work with old images with the question, do you want to reproduce these old images? Will it actually transport the message or the information you want to get across? Or will it transport the message that is embodied in the image? You know, when you have an image like this, which is actually an artistic form, but relating back to anthropometric images, when you reproduce an anthropometric images, will people remember that image? Or will they remember what you tell about the image if you examine it critically? Um, so there are definitely still problematic issues when you think about anthropology and photography, um, but that doesn't mean that anthropology and photography are not open for various um, interpretations or contemporary adaptations. And this um, image in the upper left and the one in the lower right are artistical practices of using anthropological photos um, from an art perspective. So photog photography that has its um, source in anthropology can still be used by, by various um, stakeholders, be it artists, lawyers, source communities, um, and various others. And this is, I think, where I want to leave it for today. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of questions you can ask or you don't want to ask now, but um, that's the last slide, saying thank you for the attention, and if there are questions, please um, feel free. Could, could you say something more about your uh, your uh, research now? Because you are interested in Indian community in uh, in Germany, right? Come again? About the uh, Indian community in uh, Germany or in uh, how? Or no. 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 What I'm doing um, these days is looking at various forms of digital return on various forms of digitizing um, old photographs um, and I'm looking at particularly how for example this um, project is doing it or the people behind it what are their intentions why do they upload old photographs on the on the internet um, what what you know do they have in mind as well as um, you know, other other institutions in um, Germany or um, Europe are, are doing, like how do say museums who are established here um, digitize their stuff and put it online, what's their intention, what's their practice, how do they do it, why do they do it, do they have this idea about digital return does make um, sense or yeah. So, so, so you actually follow up the, the second life of photography yes. after death and this will be my, not my question, but it was interesting that the guy, your friend in, uh, in India, mm. who is beginning for a while as a god, he played this role of god there, mm. he said that, uh, that the museum or archives works as a, they just freeze the living culture or the, that the, this living culture are dying there slowly. And, uh, do you agree with him? Because it's, it's actually probably not true because it's, the museum is just uh, 
just, uh, I don't know, just some place where it's put something and then it became more real probably or more alive than it was before because it can be used for another reasons. I mean, in another context, it's photos or... Uh, I, I mean, if you are really follow up this using, you know, what mm. people are, what they are uh, doing with these photos or, you know, I mean, if it is uh, sometimes misused, for example, for mm. or some specific reasons or political reasons or, you know, I mean, uh, if you can say something like yeah. that about that. I mean, I do agree to some extent with Balakrishnan. Like he said, you know, in a museum it's, it's frozen. You know, we can't use it anymore in the way it once was intended to be. Like when these objects were produced, they were produced with the intention of being performed. They were produced with the intention of being, you know, put, um, you know, brought to life through the performance. And if you transplant objects or photographs into a museum or into an archive, you always sort of take them away from their original context and transplant it into a different one, which can be read, yes, from his perspective as you know, killing it to some extent, which would be a hard word, which he's not using, but yeah, it's, it's not alive anymore. Um, and you have to be you have to be true and say in museums what is put on display and maybe used by you know people who come to the museum and looked at as a means of communication is probably like two to five percent right so everything else in the museum is just in the basement is locked away like nobody looks at it um, so yeah he does have a point by saying taking out of the context put into the museum dead which is a simplistic way of um, I created, but yeah. Um, but there always is that, also that, you know, upper divide the social life of things. Everything has various stages of meaning of life, like various biographical chapters, if you want to put it this way, and it can be used again. And museums also, they are not stable. They are also, on the one hand, you remember, there are places of memory which are, you know, just, <coughs> locking something away in order to construct history which is sort of written and fixed but they're also transformed into something you know like a contact zone where you want to get people to interact with the objects on various issues so it's a bit yeah it's, it's in flux it's not as stable but there is a connotation of yes um, museums and archives are trying to fix something which once has been appropriated differently I'd like to ask a question which is sort of connected to the first one. But what have, so let's say uh, thousands of photographs have been available to, you know, to, to anybody. Mm. And what's actually happening with uh, the researchers' community, you know? Is there any development? You know, because I, I'm a researcher myself and I'd be, you know, it's, uh, there are so many uh, possibilities, you know? There's so much stuff to study, mm. but uh, you know, has there been any new trend in this? Because the research means going to archives, you know, searching for things. You have to be sort of you do de detective work actually. No, well, I mean, you do detective work online. I mean, that's probably a uh, um, because it looks it's being researched, but when it's published somewhere or it's Made available, but it hasn't been evaluated, you know, research properly. Well, I, I'd say, I'd say, I mean, properly. What is what is properly is probably the the, the question because, yeah, I mean, if you explain, <laughs> so you could say putting something online requires some preliminary research. So mostly people don't just put the stuff online, but they have a brief idea of what that is. Say, mostly in historical sense. They know who took the image, they know um, what, say, expedition it was taken, um, taken at, they know what time it was taken at, what place it was taken at, right? So if you put a photo collection online, you usually do some preliminary research. And then some people might say, okay, so now it's published online, that has been done, research has been done, but you would probably say, well, no, actually, this is, this is not enough. 
Now it's online, I might not be able to go to the archive and dig into it because I can access it online. But I, for example, am interested now in, I don't know, headdresses in Ghana in the 1920s. And this hasn't been researched, it's just online. So you go and you do your research. And then you say, okay, now there has been research done on that. And then someone else comes and says, well, actually, it's nice that thing about the headdresses in Ghana, but what I'm interested in is, say, I don't know, um, cows in Ghana in the 1920s. Oh, yes. And you look at the images and you find cows and then you're like a biologist and you say something about cows or about visual representations. You're an artist and you're saying, oh, I'm interested in, you know, and there's so many more research questions. So just by putting it online is, is, is not sufficient to, to say, you know, now research has been done. It's just a way of making access easy and I think that's the, that's the beauty of it because how, how, much, how much time and resources do you have to go to all these archives? Yeah, but it's limited. my point was that it, if every, everything is made easier and easier. But the, but the questions connected to it. If there's any progress in the methodology. Yes, the methods change. Of course, methods change, but also questions change. They might become more complex. I mean, could you, could you ask yourself about digitization processes 30 years back? No, because there haven't been digitization processes. So you can look at it also from this kind of meta perspective. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily it's easier because did you know about these archives? No, right? So more is available, yes, but it also comes with the challenge that there's so much available, so how do you know about it? And also if you look, I mean, if you're writing an essay or if you, if you do some artwork and you want to relate to other artists doing something, and where do you start, where do you stop? I mean, just the way to access, it's, I wouldn't say it has become easier, it's become differently. And this is why I think it's important to look at algorithms, for example, or search engines, or, you know, methods of, of getting information, which I could tell you something about the people of India, eight volumes, blah, 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 blah. This was the standard in 1875. But these days, we also have to reflect on, you know, what is actually the standard of getting your information. And it's not always um, funny what you find out. Any more questions? Can I, can I just ask briefly if any of you is thinking about um, either using anthropology or photography in his um, artistic practices? <laughs> you? Yeah. yeah, I've worked with photo station, for example, or doing my research, so that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it is, I'm just trying to um, you know, encourage you if you use if you use photographs um, or if you use ideas about people. I mean, either anthropological photographs can be a good resource in order to you know do your artistic practices, like you know create your artwork. Um, but you should try to be um, if you do that a bit um, conscious about the kind of you know history that is behind it in in order to you know. <coughs> Yeah, just, just reflect on things that are possible, um, as well as some kind of sensitive issues which might be connected to it. Um, but I would still encourage you know, everyone to, to use it, because it's a, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource or wonderful method um, to you know, either anthropologically or artistically um, work with that stuff. I'm just doing some research of photographs, <laughs> you know, on the ground floor, you know, like with thousands of photographs, just trying to sort them out. So, thank you for the lecture and to go. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah, no, no, but it's, it's yeah, you got something out of it. Just take this. Uh, I'll do today's photography because uh, I, one biggest problem you mentioned was uh, from the fact that these photographies, photographs, are taken uh, by someone else who wanted to depict the situation in, in his own uh, uh, concept. Or mm. It's not. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, like uh, these people are taking taking uh, pictures of themselves, yeah. but somebody else was. Uh, and today, 
we have uh, like selfie stuff and social networks and everything. Uh, it, and it seems quite uh, ideal. Like uh, we have people all around the world taking uh, who are working with uh, with uh, their own image, mm -hmm. uh, creating profiles, and everything is uh, online already. Mm -hmm. So is this a big new field in which we can uh, study and doing art or, uh, or not? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely yes. It is a big new field, um, and they. And they, what I sort of heard is, is everything better now, right? Because people are taking the images of themselves. So it's not this colonial photographer who comes with his ideas and they're distributing it themselves. So we don't have that problem of the archive, you know, locking them away and no access, right? Which is true, yes, but, yeah. of course I have to say, but, um, I mean, if you take a selfie, you're still framing, right? So you're still taking an image and there are like lots of you know tutorials online, for example, how to take the perfect selfie, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you come across it. It's hilarious. There are also some for men, even though most are for women. Um, there are all these tutorials online from which you can see that it's never just it's never just the way you want to do it or you just instantly do. But a, it's definitely. It's definitely not dictated, but let's say framed by societal um, expectations. So you wouldn't do, you know, you wouldn't do a selfie like you know, early morning from from this angle. Like you wouldn't do it. Um, so society definitely has its its impact, which is something you should look into because it's it's brilliant and it's interesting. Um, and the the second aspect is still um, technicality. Because you also need the technical devices in order to be able to do selfies. Like in these early days, it wasn't possible with cameras like this, and then even you know, even a Pentax was 500 grams, you just couldn't do selfies. Um, so, so yes, framing is still there, and it's not so much done with the intention of the colonial photography documenting someone else, but it's done with a person sometimes having a narcissistic kind of view or always wanting someone to reassure you by you know likes or yes great image you know you need this kind of response from people so it is very problematic society definitely demanding a particular way of, of selfies and psychologically challenging um, and access yes of course access is there um, but there's also this mass this mass of um, you know images all around which makes again not access hard but the kind of selection very very hard so please um take pose and you know juxtapose and that would be really interesting um to see how people did photos back then and how people do selfies now um what similarities and differences are there okay I mean, I don't want to, you know, extend it um, beyond pain. Um, so I'll, I'll be around for this if anyone is, um, you know, wants to ask something not in front of the audience. But everybody else, thanks for coming. Um, it was a pleasure to be here, and yeah, I hope you have a nice evening. Thanks. <laughs>